Hello healers, my name is Ben and this is The Moss Report. I'm here today with my father, author, and founder of The Moss Report, Dr. Ralph W. Moss. Hi, Dad. Hi, Ben. So I guess today we're going to be talking about green tea as it relates to cancer. Um, what can you tell us? <laughs> There's a lot to say. First, I'm going to take a sip of my black tea. <laughs> I'm going to have a sip I'm of my peppermint tea. But um, so when I put into, into PubMed, you know, this repository of 35 million uh, medical journal articles on every topic under the sun, medical topic, uh, put in the term green tea and the term cancer, both of them in quotation marks. So we get the, you know, the exact uh, phrase, those exact phrases or words. I come up with 2,586 results. And is that uh, a lot? I mean, it yeah, sounds like a lot. It is a lot. And they're coming in at a, at a rate of about um, one every one new one every uh, three days, I would say. Well, when and you go are, back. These are articles that are uh, being published as scientific studies? Correct. Or, these are only, okay. these are peer reviewed, overwhelmingly peer reviewed. Uh, journal articles, or they could be chapters in medical textbooks. A few um, publications meant for the lay person are included, like Scientific American. But overwhelmingly, these are journal articles, which means they go through the peer review process where experts uh, judge the paper in advance of publication for accuracy and, and other problems. And so it's a rigorous generally. And, and before you get into the specifics of any of those articles yeah. that you picked up on, let me yeah. just ask you about, is it only a select few people who are just kind of spamming the universe around this topic or no. are these independent <clears throat> studies being done by many different scientists, researchers from around yeah. the world? Yeah, the latter is the case. They're being done by many different groups, but preponderance of the papers are from China, uh, Korea, and Japan. Not surprising because those are, you know, high consumer, high producers and consumers of green tea. And uh, certainly in the case of China, uh, consumption of green tea goes back thousands of years. And it's, it's the, the most consumed beverage in China it out, far outpaces anything else that you're likely to, to see. And I think I saw a figure the other day that two thirds or three quarters of the beverages consumed in China were, were green tea. But there's something. That's a lot of know, green tea. I know I, on my two visits to China, uh, you know, you see a lot of people with thermoses and <clears throat> bottles drinking green tea, not so much colas or soft drinks as you do in the United States. So, so this is a huge agricultural crop if they're if two thirds or however many percentage yeah. uh, the beverages that they drink in China is green yeah, tea. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of green tea. A lot of green tea. Is the industry funding the study into the relationship between green tea and cancer or is it? I, I don't see that in the in the documents. Okay. But I think they're I think there's a, you know, there's a cultural bias in the sense that every in every country that the things that you do and that you prize and that define your help define your culture, you tend to have a positive view of, and no doubt that the Chinese, I mean, this is just an odd thing that the Chinese papers are, on the whole, although they're very they're objective, but they tend to f come up with more positive conclusions than papers from the West, which are scarce anyway. I've been looking through the DeVita textbook, the new edition of the DeVita textbook. I, maybe it's my, my problem, but I can't find the term green tea anywhere in that book. And I've looked uh, three or four times now. So, you know, it isn't the topic of, let's put it this way, of great interest to American oncologists. Um, it, uh, that's one, one problem. The other problem is that green tea is, 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 there's so many varieties of it. There's so many different ways of preparing it. And some of those ways and some of the, and the different patterns of consumption, 
and some of those could be harmful and overconsumption. Likewise. Well, wow. for instance, for instance, drinking very hot beverages in general uh, create, raises the rate of esophageal cancer and mm. maybe cancer of the of the of the head and neck, possibly the stomach. So there's that issue is like what te- what's the temperature that people are drinking if you if you find for instance that green tea increases the rate of some of the cancers of the aerodigestive system is that the green tea doing it or is it or is it the just the temperature of the green tea and if they drank uh, these people drank anything else it would also be harmful or at, almost as harmful as as the green tea the other thing is that there's nothing, you know, like the, uh, the, the ancient said, everything is in the dose. Everything, you know, is a poison, but it depends on the dose. I myself, I'm a, I'm a big fan of green tea. I take green tea frequently. I drink green tea frequently, but there's a limit to how much I can have. And the reason is because I get palpitations, heart palpitations from caffeine. On average, uh, I would say that the amount of caffeine in, in tea, I forget the exact number, but it's a fraction of what's present in coffee. Not everybody's going to have palpitations from drinking caffeine, caffeinated beverages. I, I do. So I imagine other people might do, might have that as well. So if yeah. someone is uh, taking this for health purposes, they probably wouldn't want to have it too late in the day, lest it also Correct. interfere with their sleep patterns. So it has, you know, there's, it's a two-edged sword. Um, there is no, no uh, universal agreement on whether and how a, a green tea prevents cancer. But I'd like to go through some of the evidence, and I have some good data on this that will put it in perspective. You said there is no known evidence? No, I said there's that. no agreement. Okay. Among scholars, among scientists, there's no agreement. Okay, I was going to say, with all of those studies, there must be somebody claiming it has a benefit. Absolutely. Okay. No, there's a, there's a large number of people, uh, especially in China, who affirm the effectiveness. But I think the problem is that it, green tea seems to be positive in terms of preventing cancer for some kinds of cancer and not so for others and uh, and overall they're positive that the more drinking green tea is associated with less cancer and the more you drink within limits the the better the 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 less cancer there's going to be but i would comment that if you take china the incidence of cancer in china traditionally historically was very low and as they adopted a west a more western diet the incidence of cancer began to rise surprise surprise you know the 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 all the things going on in china since um you know the last 50 years uh have gone hand in hand with an in, increases in in cancer for me that was symbolized I went to, on my first trip to China, I visited uh, um, uh, the uh, Fudan uh, Cancer Institute in Shanghai to see a scientist there who was doing some very interesting traditional uh, work with, with um, toad venom and uh, skin of, of toads and an anti-cancer effect, a traditional Chinese remedy, by the way. And I visited him at the hospital where he was working. And behind where him, where we were talking, they were erecting an enormous cancer hospital. It, it was a very vivid visual reminder of the ex- explosion of cancer cases in China since the adoption of, you know, more Western ways and, um, the, and the diet you know, you see people are pretty well fed, but what are they eating? I mean, some people, I, I saw people eating just hot dogs on a stick and things like like this, not the highest quality thing. So I think 
when people eat their traditional diet, the traditional ways, they are pretty well protected, not 100%, but they're pretty well protected against cancer. So if you're looking at that data, then how can you extrapolate specifically the relationship between incidences of cancer and green tea if it hasn't been no, extracted from other aspects of their diet? Well, you have to ask people. So you mostly you carry you 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 give questionnaires based upon people's recollection. This is the basis of epidemiology, is population-based studies of food has this built-in flaw that if you're going to ask people, you have to hope and pray that they're going to recollect correctly what they've done and not give you the answer that you they think you want. You know, So there's a lot of possibilities for error, but that's true for every way of testing something, including randomized controlled trials are also have limitations and possible biases in them. So of the several thousand PubMed articles that you sort of browse through, were there any that stood out? Yes. So what do what when you have a, a great number of studies and there's some uh, there's some disagreement among the the studies, as there often is, you go to a higher level of proof, which is the systematic reviews and the meta-analyses. These are ways of combining the different studies in order to see what the, if you were, as if they were all one study and see what the results are. And this and, is the type of study that was done in our recent conversation about olive oil, which we'll link to. Correct. Um, correct. A meta-analysis. So they yeah. take a large number of studies and they they take that data and they plug it in and then they look at it in an aggregate form. Is that right? Yes. Correct. Very good. And that, and there is a, within the broad field of evidence-based medicine, which is to say medicine, uh, which bases itself upon the strength of the data that's available for the, any particular question, there's a pyramid. And the pyramid of evidence-based medicine at the bottom of it, you could you could say that there's case histories, or different pyramids have different um, different bases. But uh, could be animal and test tube studies, and then in the human studies, uh, professional opinion is actually at the bottom of reliability for um, making for medical decision making. So just because a, a doctor or a scientist says something is so doesn't make it so. That's obvious to us. But how often in life, you know, we defer to the opinion of the expert. So we don't worry too much about the opinions of the experts. Now you go up the pyramid and you come to the different famous fa uh, phases of clinical trials, one, two, and three, three being the highest normally that you encounter. Those are randomized controlled trials. And then above that, above that are systematic reviews and meta-analyses, which is what we're talking about, where you take all the existing or the relevant trials, mostly the randomized controlled trials, and then you subject them to analysis. You throw out the ones that aren't really relevant to your question and you refine it and so forth. And then you treat that as if it was a single study of that topic. And that's considered the highest, higher than the RCT, higher than the randomized control trial are these studies of studies, as they're sometimes called. They're part of the peer review process. Mm -hmm. So this is the traditional way that science vets the the accuracy or yeah the accuracy and the honesty of different studies and studies if they if they do have industrial um, support are supposed to list that at the end of the study now it doesn't always happen so there are ways around you know there are ways to cheat if you're really intent on cheating most people are uh, most scientists are honest and they don't do that 
and they're supposed to, but they are supposed to, in most contexts, supposed to reveal their interest. Now, for instance, you could have you could have a study that's supported by the tea industry or the olive industry, or let's say, but if the, the question is, do they have any input into the study mm -hmm. and uh, are they paying the people who are doing the study and mm -hmm. were they, did they influence the evaluation? We know this goes on widespread in the drug business, right. all those, all those negative things, but I don't see any, red flags when I look at the studies on, on green tea. If I, di if I do, I will usually downgrade my, my reliance on those papers. There's not much I can do about it, but I, I, won't, I won't flag those for attention. If somebody's looking at a meta-analysis, does it help if the origin of that analysis comes through, let's say, a university or other institution? rather than a, an individual or a group of individuals? Yes. Yeah. So the, I look at all those things. I look at the, the quality of the paper where it's being published. I look at the affiliate, academic affiliations or other affiliations of the authors, the way even, even who the peer reviewers were. Sometimes that's listed, which is very good. Um, I look at the, I look at the, the the number of other papers that have cited the paper not that you know we often talk about how few citations some really excellent papers get but all of these things come into play and in giving you a general feeling of reassurance on the accuracy of what's right. being said so yeah. you found uh, one of these meta analyses that has I found to... better i found something better than that okay i, I found a paper and we'll give the link uh, to it from the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition published in 2021. By the way, that's another thing I look at is how recent was the paper done? And the authors um, are at the National Cancer Center of Tokyo, Japan, which is very nice because, uh, you know, it's a government agency. And then down at the midway, in figure two, it, it shows green tea consumption and overall risk of cancer and cardiovascular disease from recent meta-analyses. And there are uh, uh, more than a dozen meta recent meta-analyses, um, 15, 15 of them. So, so not only this is this is an aggregate of the aggregates. Correct. Okay. It's a graphic, uh, a graphic representation, very clear because it shows the relative risk of cancer with, uh, with a higher, you know, uh, level of, of green tea consumption. And then they give all the, you know, all the, the details, but the, um, uh, decreased risk. Uh, so then they start with total cancer mortality, which um, is just about the same uh, for total cancer mortality, but for the incidence of, um, uh, of different particular kinds of cancer, it can be very considerable. So you're looking at bladder, I'll tell you the ones that, that well, I'll go through the list. So, so bladder was about the same, whether you drank it, it wouldn't uh, decrease according to these meta analyses, it wouldn't decrease the, uh, the, uh, I uh amount of, of cancer in these, uh, in these, in this population, but it would decrease it for breast cancer. It would decrease it for esophageal cancer for lung cancer, uh, considerable like about a 40% decrease for uh, liver cancer, decreased for Hodgkin's lymphoma, decreased for oral cancer and prostate and ovarian. And then also a very considerable decrease in cardiovascular disease mortality and for incidence of stroke. 
down to about 35 or 40 percent decrease. Wow. So I think that this is super good. And why that is that some would be affected and not others, I, I don't have an answer to that. But it, it's cancer is 100 or 200 different diseases. I mean, they're all species of a particular you know, kind of disease, but it can, something could have a positive effect on one kind of cancer and not particularly on another. <clears throat> so we've talked about the fact that green tea contains caffeine. I'm going to um, make an assumption that caffeine is not the molecule or that has this anti-cancer property. So do they have uh, an idea of what the molecule or group of molecules are that yeah. are proving to have that benefit? Well, they call those uh, catechins, catechin, C-A-T-E-C-H-I-N. And those are antioxidants. They're anti. They're powerful, powerful antioxidants. And if I think, uh, I'll quote from memory. I think that of the catechins within green tea, EGCG, uh, which is epigallocatechin, uh, I, that is about seventy-five percent of the catechins uh, in the green tea. So sometimes you can do a search for just for EGCG. And you'll pick up uh, papers that you wouldn't have found by putting in the search term green tea. I see. And so with the meta-analysis, it, does it include studies that relate to EGCG specifically, the, the one that you're re referencing? Some of them uh, were studies where they did measure the amount of EGCG, but I'm only seeing that in one or two cases. Um, yeah, it's mentioned throughout the paper, but it isn't the main thing by any means. No, they're, they're talking to people about their green tea consumption, not, not their EGCG consumption. If we're going to draw a conclusion from mm -hmm. this meta-analysis and we hear that the science is saying that there are anti-cancer effects among those types of cancers that you mentioned, yeah. um, isn't it a bit of a leap to get right into EGCG then and say, if you take that as a supplement, let's say, which I'm assuming it is available. Um, oh, yeah. Sure. So, but, but what, how could we then just make that as, assertion then? Well, you wouldn't want to take just EGCG because as with so many botanical compounds, the other compounds that are included in the plant are also beneficial and add to your main component. You, you would definitely need both. In other words, you could take the EGCG or the, the pill, the concentrated, mm -hmm. it could be a concentrated green tea pill. But if you did that, the, the wise course would be to also be drinking some green tea. So you'd get the subsidiary compounds, the other catechins that are in the green tea. Otherwise, it's like something unbalanced. It's you're, Yes, you're extracting the most powerful or most beneficial thing, but in nature, that's going to be uh, working in concert with those other, other compounds. Mm -hmm. And I have some personal experience with this because when I had uh, prostate cancer in 2015, um, in the fall of 2015, so now coming up on uh, eight years, um, I took green, green tea capsules uh, every four hours for the next six months. That was the main quote unquote alternative thing that I did uh, afterwards. I took other supplements. Was it a green, was it an EGCG capsule or was it? Uh, no, it was a capsule. Tea. It was called Capsule T, okay. C A P S O L hyphen T. No, again, we have to disclaim we have no connection to the people who make this uh, this uh, up this pill, and it it was unique in a couple of ways. They part of the a part of taking that was that they made a decaffeinated sustained release form for taking at night. Because I wanted to, ha I wanted to keep some of that, uh, those catechins, those antioxidants in my system 
24/7 for a while after my uh, after I had my cryoablation procedure for my for my prostate cancer to to mop up uh, remaining cancer cells that might be especially that might be in the bloodstream. So I wanted to keep those in the um, in, you know in my body, but there's no way to no practical way to do that with the ordinary uh, EGCG pills or green tea pills because it's very rare. I mean, you can sometimes find decaffeinated green tea pills, but there is no other, there, I could find no other brand and still can't that was both um, decaffeinated and sustained release. And there was a third thing, which was that there were experiments to show that the addition of a little bit of red pepper activated the green tea, made it much more effective. And I was under... An adjuvant. An adjuvant, exactly. Yeah, oddly enough, uh, it was was the red pepper that did this, and nothing did it to that extent. So they had, the people who made the capsule tea had added a a very small amount, maybe maybe one or two percent of the pill, but it was in the form of red pepper, so you didn't have to go put some Frank's hot sauce on your on a cracker and eat that. You know, you could <laughs> you could uh, get it right all in one in one shot, and then you could take two pills at night at ten a at ten p.m., which is when I would go to bed, and then that would carry you through to six the next morning. So each pill lasted four hours, and then the two pills sustained release would last eight hours. So I was covered. The, what led me to this, aside from the, my general knowledge about green tea, you know, which everybody has, was that the test that led me to discover my prostate cancer and may very well have saved my life was, was a test that was around at that time uh, called Oncoblot. It was a test for a substance called Enox-2 and Dr. J- James Moray and Dorothy Moray, two professors at Purdue University in Indiana, had discovered that this Enox-2, which was uh, characteristic of cancer, had different that the, the the different types of cancer produced Enox-2 of different molecular weight, and so by putting the the, the blood serum through this filter, through this process, you could, it would fall at a different place because the weight was different of the Enox 2 by purifying it. I, I, I can, that's the best I can do to explain. You mean inside of a centrifuge or something? If you... Ins- yes, inside of a, inside a device that would separate out the Enox 2. But he had noticed these were two very distinguished biochemists, husband and wife team, uh, at a major Midwestern university, okay? And I think, I forget, but Jim had published like 400 papers, you know. These were elderly, older, but highly decorated and distinguished scientists. So I had no reason not to believe him. I got to know him because I'd written, I wrote about his work, which I thought was exciting. And yeah. then I took the test myself and and the test could tell you whether you had even the beginnings of 31 different kinds of cancer, they had, they, because they knew where the blot would occur. It was like blotter paper and then where the, and the shape and the size of it and so forth gave them further information. But this was a dream come true, this test, because it could take a person who had no sign of cancer and be able to predict to tell whether or not cancer was forming or whether they had it. One problem was it couldn't tell you how, if even if it identified your cancer, it couldn't tell you how advanced it was or how large it was. It would detect small, very small amounts or very large amounts, but it looked the sa- basically the same. So the next step was up to you. So your mom and, and, and I both took that test just because we wanted to know whether we were prone to have any kind of cancer. She luckily uh, was not, did not have anything. And mine came back loud and clear that I had prostate cancer. 
So, of course, I was completely stunned. And then, then all the things that happened then, which we have discussed in other videos, uh, ensued. But here, you know, here I am oh, eight years later, feeling great, you know, no, no problems that I'm aware of. Of course, there could, could always be problems, but I'm not, you know, aware of it. I don't take any sup and I don't take any drugs whatsoever. Um, you know, so I'm in good shape and no sign of any recurrence of the cancer. So I, I do ascribe this to, uh, the tip off that I got from this Enox test. So what does this have to do with green tea? Well, so the mores in studying what counteracted the Enox to went through a whole host of different, uh, food components and food supplements and so forth. They were very, she was professionally in the question of interest, you know, professor of food science. He was just a, he was a biochemist. And the one that leaped out was EGCG and green tea. And furthermore, when they, they were the ones who discovered that if you added in the, um, the, the hot pepper, Mm -hmm. that it enhanced the effect of the green tea. So I was, you know, I mean, I was super impressed, needless to say, with the, with the accuracy of their test, their prostate test, because I didn't know, aside from the fact that they were highly reputable scientists, but I had no personal knowledge of how effective it or accurate it was. And here it was, suddenly they told me, you've got prostate cancer is blown away by this. But of course, that I went to have testing and biopsy and, and everything done. It, it was exactly correct. And mm -hmm. that was, I wasn't the only one that this happened to. There were hundreds, if not thousands of people who used this test and, you know, got similar benefit from it. And, and did she publish her findings specifically around EGCG? Did she Yes, they published it, but it was more, he was more, the more um, famous scientist. They, they published papers together. I don't know that she published them separately. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they both were elderly and they both passed away mm -hmm. uh, not too long after, uh, after this. And the family didn't, wasn't able to keep the discover, the, you know, the test going. And so it vanished from the world. And I think this was one of the great great losses really that I've experienced in, in my career was the loss of that, that, uh, test, mm -hmm. that Anka Blot test. Uh, someday maybe it'll come back. I hope so. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we could use it in so many circumstances. So getting back to that meta analysis then. Well, the studies that are done, oftentimes it'll show in the analysis, it'll show no uh, particular effect. But when you look at the individual studies, you see major effects. And that's not even including the effect on cardiovascular deaths or including uh, incidence of stroke, which is also highly positive. And I think one can, you know, if you look at the individual studies, like on breast cancer, there are 12 studies, right? And the, the rate of breast cancer is lower in, in uh, 11 out of the 12 studies that are done on breast cancer. Some of those studies show a 56%. There's one that shows a 56% reduction in breast cancer in people who, 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 who drink green tea over those who don't drink it. Well, that's a big uh, deal. Yeah. Another one showed a 53% reduction. Okay. We're, we're not, we're, it just, I want to clarify because mm -hmm. when we talk about reduction, um, yeah. someone might th jump to the conclusion that we're talking about a reduction of, let's say the size of a mass no, in a cancer. Um, but we're talking about this as it relates to prevention. If a person is dealing with an active diagnosis is there any potential drawback or conflict uh, indicated around taking green tea or EGCG as a supplement if one is also taking other medications or other types of treatments? There's a number of potential things. One would be the caffeine. Caffeine, as you would expect, speeds up the metabolism. And, and it actually has been suggested that people... Uh, be given 
I mean, some doctors have suggested that people be given uh, caffeinated beverages before taking chemo because it might increase the, the rate at which it is taken up by the cells. So I'm not saying it's a bad thing to have caffeine, but I wouldn't suggest self-medicating to do that because you might increase the side effects uh, inadvertently of the, of the chemo. You know, it's a delicate thing. You're, with chemotherapy, you're putting poisonous substances into the body. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to just willy-nilly start adding other things. That I'm a great believer that on the whole, antioxidants don't conflict with chemo. But that's a statement more directed at the oncology community than it is, you know, at each individual patient, because this is, I believe that that antioxidants and things like green tea are strong medicine. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that they're, you know, we call them, of course, they're just foods and you could just take them, you know, recreationally or whatever, nutritionally, but they also have medicinal effects. So if you believe that it's powerful enough to benefit you, you have to also believe it's powerful enough to possibly do the opposite. So um, I would say this, that if you are thinking of, let's say, augmenting your treatment with green tea or some other sort of treatment, you should discuss this with the, the, the oncologist or ask them for a referral to a nutritionist. Now, they might, they might tell you that you shouldn't do it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with asking for the evidence. The, if the answer is because I don't know enough about it or something like that, well, you know, then you're, you're sort of back where you started. But on the whole, it's a good idea to uh, have that discussion with the oncologist, and then you'll get the all clear so that it's okay to, to do something. There's also the issue that some tea has fluor- fluoride, fluorine in it, and oh, really? fluorine can stain your, you know, model your teeth. So there is that issue, and tea can also stain your teeth. I mean, that can be removed through, um, you know, through regular cleaning, dental hygiene. But you know, there are, there's always, su- you know, pluses and minuses to everything. Green tea less so than than the than the uh, black tea, but um, by and large. It's interesting that tea came into the Western world as a health drink. Mm -hmm. This is how it was identified. The first mention of that excellent China beverage or something that somebody in the like 16th century or 17th century uh, mentioned, it was as a, as drunk people drank it for their health. And I think that's pretty accurate. And of course it became then a craze in England, you know, uh, coffee and tea both. So uh, I think it, it deserves its reputation as a health drink, but I would say within moderation. And if you want to take it in terms of, of, a, of, of a pill, then you should consider adding a little bit of red pepper sauce uh, on a, on, you know, on, uh, I don't know how, put, I never tried putting it into my beverage, but uh, you could have it on a piece of cracker or a piece of cucumber or something. And uh, this would, according to Jim Moray's uh, studies, this would in, even more enhance the effectiveness of it. And, and uh, does this substance, EGCG, only occur in green tea, not in other types of teas? Much less in other in other kinds of teas. There are other, are other compounds in the... Black tea is also beneficial. I have my black tea here. Mm-hmm. But um, not as. Mm -hmm. It's a fraction. I think it's about a third. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I think quality matters in everything. Um, I go for the Japanese green teas, the ones that are flown, you know, even though they're a little expensive, but the ones that are flown in. I like Sencha tea. People like matcha. I know our audience. I'm sorry, say that again. A lot of people like matcha tea. They put it in a smoothie or make it up traditionally. Yeah, And that has uh, the desired quality? That's the highest amount. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah, because it's the whole leaf. I see. So you don't n- normally eat the whole leaf of, uh, of green tea. Uh-huh. Interesting. Um, I guess, you know, knowing our audience, some people are going to weigh in on this and say something about 
how they use pesticides and you have to buy organic. Um, is that, yeah. to your knowledge, a, um, a concern? Uh, is it a highly pesticided crop, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge, but I do look for organic teas. I'm very picky. Uh, mm -hmm. No pun, no pun intended, but I get these, I get these, uh, these Japanese little sa sacks of Japanese tea, and they're a little bit expensive, but it says right on it, organic Fuka Mushika. Mm -hmm. um, and then and, you have your own little strainer that you put that in and you... Right, right. Now, do you, just in, in terms of the actual preparation of it, uh, do you use one batch for one cup or do you reuse the... I use, the, a, a, le I use a level teaspoon and I get, I get two, two cups out of that. Mm -hmm. But it also comes with instructions on the back of each thing. Like this one says uh, 120 to 180 seconds, not minutes, seconds, that's two to three minutes, if my math uh, it holds. Mm -hmm. uh, they say six grams of tea or 0.2 ounces per cup. I don't know anything about what that is. All right. I know is one t level teaspoon. And it's amazing that the difference in taste between a little bit more and a little bit less, you have to find you know what pleases you the most. But you're not with Japanese teas, you do not let them soak for a long time. Mm -hmm. This one, the one I, I I most recently got, which is which is this mm -hmm. different brand. This is Sencha tea, and this one, they say brew for one minute. So some of them you only Japanese tea you only brew it just for one minute, mm -hmm. and some of them you brew it up to two or three. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing about Japanese tea, they're so delicate that you don't want to pour boiling water the way you do with a cheap tea bag, let's say. You don't want to pour boiling water. You want to let the water settle a bit and be hot, but not scorching hot. It's better for you because it, you might harm your esophagus if you had something that was too hot. So your opinion is that if someone is trying to include natural uh, substances in their diet in order to help prevent cancer, that green tea would be right on the list. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, and we'll put links to everything that we've discussed, this different studies, as well as uh, a couple of your favorite products uh, in the description. Yeah. Um, but for now, for the Moss Report, I'm Ben Moss. How are you healing today?